Dina, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and talk about pelvic floor health. Yes, of course. I'm so excited. I'm pretty excited too. Um, so would you start off and maybe just share like what you do mm -hmm. and all of the things you do? Because I feel like you have so many um, kind of different, you're in so many different areas within this space. Yeah, yeah. I am a physical therapist um, and also a Mercier therapist. I'm a physical therapist, so I treat orthopedics, um, but I also specialize in women's health or pelvic floor in general. Um, and so I see tons of pelvic floor patients and I've been doing that for over nine years and I love it. Um, so treating all pelvic floor dysfunctions. Um, and then also I am a mercy therapist. Mm -hmm. It always, it probably won't even pick that up, but let's go ahead and start over. Okay. okay. <laughs> Since we're this close to the beginning. Okay, Tina, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me about public floor health. Would you start off and just describe a little bit about what you do? Yes. Um, so I'm a physical therapist, so I see orthopedic um, type injuries and um, diagnoses, but I also specialize in the pelvic floor. So I specialize in pelvic floor. I see plenty of pelvic floor dysfunction, um, both men and women, but specializing mostly in women. And um, I'm also a Mercier therapist. So that means that is a whole separate thing. I'm a Mercier therapist and I specialize in a fertility treatment that is hands-on. It's an external treatment and um, it can help with things like PCOS or scar tissue uh, from cesareans. It helps to regulate cycles um, and just really helps increase blood flow circulation to the ovaries, uterus, and surrounding tissues. So it's really rewarding. It has an 83% success rate of getting pregnant within the year of treatment for the fertility treatment itself. Um, so it's great. I love what I do and I love helping people and it's so rewarding. Okay. <laughs> there, with that, I mean, of course we could dive off into either one of these. Yes. Talk for a whole hour. Yes. Let's start with the public floor piece of it. Mm -hmm. And what kind of, when you say public floor, what are you talking about? And then why is that, why is the health of this region of our body so important? Right, right. Um, so the pelvic floor is at the base of the pelvis and it's to support the bladder and the uterus and the rectum. And so it just helps to support those organs and you need it to function properly to be able to contract and relax and have coordination when needed in order to function properly. So it's, it's so important to get the message out that there is help for pelvic floor dysfunction because so many people live with pelvic floor dysfunction not knowing they can get better. So for example, urinary leakage, jumping, sneezing, coughing, laughing, lifting heavy things, and you're having urinary leakage and women just kind of brush it off as this is normal. I'm just gonna live my life like this. Um, and I wear pads or do whatever I need to do in order to live my daily life with this urinary incontinence or stress incontinence. And it doesn't have to be that way. So it's so rewarding to see women who have been suffering with different pelvic floor dysfunctions and now can find help and find treatment because there is a solution. And usually it comes back to just having coordination between the pelvic floor and that, that muscle to brain connection. So yeah, and there's a whole bunch of different pelvic floor dysfunctions. So whether it be incontinence, constipation, pelvic pain, um, overactive bladder. So having to go to the bathroom frequently, waking up at night to go to the bathroom, um, interstitial cystitis, and prolapse and the list goes on and on. So there's a lot out there. It's very involved. Okay. So when you're working with someone, mm -hmm. do you look at what condition they're, how, how do you approach it? Do you look at what their symptoms are or do you look at just, you know, them, their anatomy and kind of figure out where, I'm assuming this is how you do it, like where they're holding tension or where they may be misaligned or even, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. That's a good question. So first they're gonna to come to me and say what the problem is. And usually by asking, me asking questions like, do you have constipation? Do you have pelvic pain? Do you have these certain issues? Then I'll know, oh, you know, it's probably that their pelvic floor might be too tight and it's upregulated. So the answer is not gonna be Kegels. We need to learn how to relax that <laughs> pelvic floor first before we just throw out that word, do Kegels. Uh, so really I'm going to hear what they have to say and based off what they're saying, 
I'll most likely come up with what's going on. And then after doing, usually at the initial evaluation, we do an internal pelvic floor muscle assessment. So if you go in to see a pelvic floor physical therapist and you have pelvic floor dysfunction, we'll check core strength, back range of motion, and we'll also do an internal pelvic floor muscle assessment to check if the pelvic floor is able to contract. Can you do a Kegel? Do you even know what that is? Can you do one without tightening your glutes and holding your breath? Um, and then also checking for pain, tension, prolapse, those types of things. So, and looking at the whole person, of course, because the core and the back and the pelvic floor, hips, everything works together. And even your feet play a huge role. So the arches of your feet and how you're supported and how you take the impact with each step can play a huge role with your flow. Okay, so I know that's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. So um, I, I think that, okay, so you, <laughs> you just covered so much. These arches of your feet, when can we, yeah. can we talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, every step you take, every has an impact on your body. So your feet are the first thing to hit the ground to absorb pressure. So you got your knees, your, your ankles and feet. I mean, your knees, your hips, and it kind of works up the kinetic chain. So we want to look at ankle range of motion and do you have any feet problems? And then are your knees okay? Hips okay? Because all of that can play an impact on the pelvic floor. Okay. So just how are you able to absorb each step you take? Um, our restrictions coming from the, um, feet or anywhere else in the body. So looking at the whole person too makes a big difference. Okay. Yeah. With, so with that, maybe just one more question about that. So with the arches of your feet, does that have anything to do with how tight your lower back is? So, cause you mentioned kind of up, you mm -hmm. know, this whole chain, does it also play a role in maybe if there is any tension in that lower back that's contributing to the overall problem? It can. I feel like everyone's so different. So it okay. might just depend on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you work with men, what does that look like? Like, what are the, I guess, what are the conditions that they present with compared with women? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually the men I see um, have prostate issues or have had prostate cancer. So they've had a prostatectomy. So now they're having like leakage issues. Uh, so really just teaching them um, bladder irritants, um, appropriate fluid intakes, um, bladder habits, toileting, better toileting habits, um, and getting their pelvic floor more coordinated and stronger along with their core. Um, so yeah, that's mostly what I see is, um, prostectomies, status post prostectomies. So after they've had cancer and a lot of them are waiting to get radiation treatment. So the doctor wants them to decrease leakage before they go to radiation. But I also see pelvic pain also, you know, as a diagnosis with men. Yeah. So with the overactive bladder piece of it, mm -hmm. what, um, actually I want us to take a step back. Okay. All right. So then when you, when you start working with someone and what does it typically look like? How long will they typically need to see you? Um, what does the session typically look like? Like, I guess the question here is more, um, how much are you manipulating hands-on versus mm -hmm. talking with the, with people about how to just improve the health of their pelvic floor? And then when we're talking about pelvic floor health, kind of what does that look like? Is it just exercises or what does it look like? Because I mean, you, yeah, you alluded to this and what you just answered, but anyway. Yeah, yeah dive in a little deeper. So like, so first with the overactive bladder, I'm going to touch on overactive bladder. Um, that is when you have to go to the bathroom often. So sometimes someone might have to go to the bathroom every 50 minutes, every hour. And it's been like this for years. Mm -hmm. So we're not only going to, we're going to teach them bladder retraining. And I can talk about that also. And then, then that's urge suppression. So how do we get it from you? Let's say going and urinating every 50 minutes to now going every hour and 15 minutes to every hour and a half to every two hours. So it's just a better quality of life. You can sit and work. You can sit through a movie um, and, you know, travel easier. Um, so all those lifestyle habits. And that, like I said, comes from exercises, coordination, bladder retraining. And then also we talk about bladder irritants. Um, that's a big one. So um, do you want to dive into bladder retraining? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is huge. I love training overactive bladder because because there's quick results. If a patient does bladder retraining and that urge suppression technique, they will see results quickly. So what it is, is let's say someone is 
just sitting at work and sitting there typing on their computer and they feel like they have to go, but they know they just went 45 minutes ago. They didn't drink any crazy amounts of fluid and they have to go again. What you want to do is you want to stop what you're doing, breathe, take, take a break for a second, do five quick Kegels. And what that does is when you do a Kegel, it's contracting the pelvic floor. When you contract the pelvic floor, it relaxes the bladder. So the bladder's not being pressed, saying like, oh, I have to go pee. You're relaxing the bladder. So do five quick Kegels, breathe, tell yourself you can wait, distract yourself, talk to a coworker, whatever you gotta do to get your mind off the fact that you have to go to the bathroom. That urge will subside. And then you just wait, keep working until that next, next urge comes, which should be, let's say 20, 30 minutes later. So now we're just trying to extend the time. So every time you feel the urge and you know you shouldn't go because you just went, do five quick Kegels, tell yourself you can wait, and then wait. Same thing if you're waking up in the middle of the night to go pee, like when you're going off to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So with that, because this also ties in so much with interstitial cystitis. Mm, and this yeah. Is something else. Yeah. Um, maybe just for anyone listening who doesn't, isn't familiar with what interstitial cystitis is, just saying what it is and then how this kind of ties in with that overactive bladder. Yes, absolutely. Um, interstitial cystitis, it used to be labeled painful bladder syndrome because it just presents like painful bladder. It kind of presents like UTI, but it's not testing positive for an infection. So it's kind of like, what do we do with this patient? Because they're saying they have kind of symptoms of UTI, but there's nothing there. So they kind of give this umbrella term of interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome. Um, usually um, bladder irritants are a huge trigger for people and bladder irritants are alcohol is a big one, soda, um, really sugary foods. Like if you have a shaved ice with like the syrup on it, that syrup and corn syrup, um, spicy foods, um, juices, citrus, um, cause of the acidity. So yeah. chocolate has caffeine and sugar, um, and kind of the list goes on and on with, and everyone's different. So some people might be really sensitive to alcohol and coffee. And another person might be really sensitive to spicy foods and soda. So we really want to try to eliminate all bladder irritants, focus on downregulating the pelvic floor. That's a whole nother topic, but downregulating the pelvic floor is to relax the pelvic floor. Cause a lot of times when you have IC interstitial cystitis, the pelvic floor gets upregulated and tight because you're in pain often. So you want to learn how to relax it simple stretches and breathing techniques. Okay. So yeah. Which is something else that you go. Yes. Which is something <laughs> else you do too is diaphragmatic breathing, uh, which is belly, you know, in your nose, out your mouth, relaxing. Anything's going to open up the pelvic floor is going to help relax it. Bring your knees to your chest, you know, child's pose, happy baby, um, deep squats and those types of things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To relax pelvic floor. Okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Um, kind of transitioning a little bit over into the Mercier therapy mm -hmm. piece of it. So how, so you started out as a pelvic floor therapist and then added on this Mercier therapy. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, can we talk a little bit about maybe how Mercier therapy is different from pelvic floor mm -hmm. therapy and then plus the overlap between the two? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mercier therapy was created by Jennifer Mercier, who is a naturopath. Um, she's a midwife. She's out in um, Chicago. And so to be a Mercier therapist, you're going to go take the course with her in Chicago. Um, and I should say Illinois because I guess it's not in Chicago. But anyway, um, this is something completely separate. So other people in the healthcare um, profession, whether it's like a massage therapist or a nurse practitioner or other healthcare professions can take this, um, professionals can take this course in order to be a Mercier therapist. Um, and this, um, like I said, is all external hands-on treatment to help increase blood flow and circulation to the uterus and ovaries and the surrounding tissues. Um, so it's just another hands-on way to help these organs function as well as they possibly can. Yeah. And you mentioned, so for conditions like, so first of all, well, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to the fertility piece separately. Okay. Um, maybe just to focus on when there's something wrong with your cycle or, or your cycle is presenting, you have PCOS or endometriosis, but it is helpful for reestablishing regularity and a healthy cycle. Yes. hundred percent. Okay. Because especially when it's, um, 
your hormones are off or there's scar tissue or things just aren't functioning properly due to, you know, changes in hormone, whether it be PCOS, the endometriosis, um, with that endometrial tissue growing outside of the uterus, this is going to help to, again, break up scar tissue, increase circulation, help just mobility of these organs to function properly. Okay. Yeah. And then for the fertility piece, because I mean, this is profound that it, the, you know, the claim that within a year of doing mercy therapy, there's an 83% chance of pregnancy, if that's a woman's goal. I mean, that's, that's profound. It is. It is. And that's based off a four year longitudinal study that Jennifer Mercier did herself. Okay. Um, So it's based off a decent amount of research that she did. Um, And so when we do it as a Mercier therapist, when we do it, this fertility treatment, we have to do her exact protocol Mm -hmm. so that for research purposes. So it's once a week for six weeks. Um, and you're going through, uh, some deep, deep pelvic organ, uh, mobilization with that. Okay. Yeah. And then with, can you maybe just describe like what a session would look like? Because Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely some superficial, more lymph movement involved. Mm -hmm. And then also that deeper work that you were just talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We're going to work the abdominal muscles and do kind of some lymph, lymphatic sweepage there, lymphatic sweeps. Um, We're going to be doing some deep, deep pressure on the uterus and and the ovaries. And that's kind of a little bit deeper technique. Um, We'll work on on the back and the glutes and um, also stretch out a few of the hip muscles in those areas. And so, um, someone just wants to be prepared to come in without a full stomach and make sure their bladder is empty. Um, when we get started for that. Okay. Yeah. And it's usually about, it's about an hour long, um, treatment. So once a week for six weeks. Okay. Hour long. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, let's see. And then the other question would be, is it okay to do when you're on your period? Mm, that's, that's a really good question. Um, yes, for most people, it's okay to do it when you're on your period. But if you do suffer from endometriosis, we don't want to do the mercy therapy technique when someone is on their heavy cycle during endometriosis, um, due to just the inflammatory response of everything. And we're getting in there to increase blood flow. And we don't want to continue to increase blood flow when there's already this endometriosis on the inside. So okay. we just we'll skip those few days that are heavier in your cycle and then just, you know, postpone it a little bit. So we'll just have to adjust the schedule based off that on those weeks where someone's on their cycle and has an endometriosis. Okay. So if someone comes to see you for the Mercier therapy Mm -hmm. piece of it, do they report back any improved symptoms for other, other things that are due to just pelvic floor dysregulation? Yes. Oh my gosh. That's such a good question. Um, yes. Um, recently had someone who has endometriosis and she just has tons of bloating and just feels a lot of congestion down in her pelvic area, just super uncomfortable. Um, she was going into surgery. She just had surgery a few weeks ago because she was just bleeding nonstop. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on, but she was having constant bleeding, um, constant bloating and just a lot of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I did a treatment for her and she felt so much better afterwards. And then usually after I do a treatment, um, it does sometimes take a few months af- uh, after you kind of finish treatment to, for your body to regulate. So your cycles might change a little bit, whether they get a little heavier or longer, but sometimes there's some regulation period. Not everyone, but some people do feel like a month or two um, after they finish treatment, their cycles might look a little different than normal. And then hopefully after that, it's regulated and you have a normal, healthy cycle. Okay. Yeah. So for women who are discontinuing birth control and especially women who, um, I'm thinking here particularly any kind of shot, the depo shot. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes it takes a while for, you know, that cycle to come back. Yes. Yes. Do you work, um, with, when, I guess with your client load, are you working more with women who are interested in conceiving or who are presenting with some kind of hormonal imbalance or maybe, you know, looking to kind of support their body as they're discontinuing birth control? I feel like I have a mixture of both. I feel like most are seeking for fertility treatment because I feel like a lot of women are not as proactive as others in, in making sure that their cycle is healthy and making sure that they are um, trying to 
I don't know, have their bodies as regular as possible or to have a healthy cycle and have their hormones be healthy. So I feel like I see more fertility because not everyone is seeking out uh, treatment if their cycles are off yeah. in that aspect, or they just don't think there's anything they can do because they don't know about it. I think that yeah. if they just don't know what can I do if my cycles aren't regular because of birth control or whatever may be. Um, so I think just people don't know. Yeah. So maybe they hear about it, but they think just the fertility side and they don't really know about like, oh, endometriosis, cycles, scar tissue, all of those things. Yeah. And I, cause I think with that, um, because, you know, you've mentioned scar tissue, uh, several times because of course it, you know, it, it, it is, if you, if you've had a previous pregnancy given birth before, especially with the cesarean, mm-hmm. um, but then also I think this, and then, and then of course, endometriosis as mm-hmm. well. But I think this whole thing about when you're, when you're on hormonal birth control, there's already um, kind of less blood flow to the mm-hmm. uterus. Mm-hmm. And so this being truly a way to, you know, improve blood flow to that region and just help support all that reproductive, all of your reproductive yeah. organs and, and fully functioning. Yes, exactly. Get everything functioning to optimal health. You want optimal yeah. health in all of your organs and even the reproductive organs. I feel like sometimes they're kind of, you don't think about them. Um, um, unless your goal is to get pregnant and that's what people do think of them. Um, and then people also don't realize like things like if you're going suffering from infertility and you go through the IUI process and then you take Clomid that can decrease the uterine lining and the integrity of the uter- uterine, um, lining. And you don't realize that and mercy therapy can help improve, um, that. So just the so, different hormones that people uh, take so- have an effect on. Yeah. So, so is it also helpful in cases of recurrent miscarriage? Yes. Yes, it can be. Um, and if someone is preparing for IUI or IVF or has recurrent miscarriages, it can help to prepare the body to sustain a pregnancy longer or have a better transfer if, um, you know, IVF was the plan down the, down the road, because now this organ is functioning better. Okay. So of course you're putting it in the optimal, um, you're, you're able to have a more optimal environment in order for IVF to be more Okay. Yeah. You can help with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you kind of, I mean, the rest of these questions are probably going to overlap a fair bit between Mercier therapy and just pelvic floor okay. in general. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask about sciatica and mm-hmm. how often you have either patients on the pelvic floor therapist side or, you know, clients on the Mercier side come to you, you know, for, for sciatica. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sciatica is definitely more of like the pelvic floor side. I think just because I'm pelvic floor PT. So I see it not only just like pelvic floor, but also it comes as like low back pain. Okay. Um, because the sag nerve is coming from that lumbar spine and they feel that pain in their glute going all the way down their leg. Okay. Um, so yeah, I see it often, um, with more like the pelvic floor side and they see it in pregnancy also, you know, as women's bellies get bigger, their back arches more, which is more lordosis, lumbar lordosis, and that can cause impingement of the sciatic nerve. So sciatic nerve pain is common in pregnancy and also more common as a low back thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted, let's see, I wanted to also ask, well, I kind of wanted to circle back around to the over, got about five questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe the constipation piece. Oh it, yeah, because, love it. Okay, and I know just in some conversations that we've had, um, because you also give recommendations about generally how you're able to support like good, good habits. Yeah, regardless. Yes. I mean, we, yeah. we, you know, you definitely provided um, some great <laughs> insight into overactive bladder. Yeah. Um, when yeah, when we're talking about going number two, like what what are some ways to support your body in that? Yes. Yes. I love it. It's funny because in my profession, I am talking about bowel movements and urinary stuff. And I mean, all of these things every day. And that's just like my, my realm. So I love talking about this. So even if I'm seeing someone for a little back pain, I might try to swoop in there something about like toileting posture. So when someone has constipation, I am going to, of course, I'm going to talk to them about diet. What are they eating for breakfast, lunch, snacks? Do they have a sweet tooth? Like I want to dive in because a lot of times doctors don't have time. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then fluid intake. How much are you drinking a day? Not only, okay, how much fluid are you taking a day? How much of it is coffee? How much of it is soda? How much of it is uh, plain water? Because it's crazy, whether it be, I'm jumping over back over to overactive bladder or interstitial cystitis or men after prostatectomies and now constipation. Like very rarely does anyone ever take the time to say, what are you consuming in a day? And it's crazy because when I break it down, usually I'll hear people drinking way more of the junk and bladder irritants, the acidic stuff, the caffeine, the sugars, than actual water. And a lot of people don't like water. So just kind of slowly shifting things. Um, if they love coffee and they are drinking 30 ounces of coffee and then 40 ounces of alcohol, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's right here, diet soda. I mean, it's, it's crazy really trying to shift that in a re it's something that's realistic for them. Yeah. Okay. You love your coffee. Let's try to go from 30 ounces a day to 20 ounces a day. Let's try to shift that coffee to a low acid organic coffee. Okay. Can you do half regular caffeine, half decaf? So slowly shifting things so you can still enjoy life and enjoy your coffee in the morning, but make it a little bit easier on the bladder or brown. Um, okay. Back to constipation. Sorry. I went off on a tangent there. Uh, so we'll talk about food intake, diet, and then toileting posture, which is huge. I want every client I talk to to get a squatty potty. Um, I think that's just a name brand, but if you Google squatty potty, they'll all pop up. Um, and they're not, they're inexpensive. If someone can't get one using a step stool, two toilet paper rolls, two yoga blocks, two boxes, whatever they have, tipped over trash can, whatever they have, you want the knees higher than the hips to improve toileting posture. So what happens is, is when we sit on our toilets and our feet are flat on the floor, there's this muscle called your puborectalis and it's pinching off that anal canal. And so it's harder for things to come out. When you put your feet up on a squatty pot of your step stool and your knees are higher than your hips, that muscle can relax and make everything easier to come out. Okay. Um, so that'll just decrease risk of straining, which you don't want to strain if you have, someone has a prolapse, especially yeah. just a great overall thing for a lifestyle. No straining when, you, when you're having a bowel movement. So it'll help decrease straining. Um, any pain that someone might have with the bowel. So toilet pot, toileting posture is huge. Okay. Knees higher than hips. Drink lots of water. <laughs> eat lots of fiber. I know Americans don't have enough fiber in their diet. They're not eating a lot of fruits and veggies in a day. So yeah, trying to just convince them to get more fiber in their diet. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that was a lot. No, it was good. <laughs> um, and so you mentioned this straining and relationship to prolapse when we were talking about um, you know, constipation mm -hmm. on the flip side, when we're talking about urination, um, yeah. Could you talk about that as well? Yeah. Like still using it, still use a squatty potty when you urinate. Okay. Um, let's say if someone does have any type of prolapse, you want to make sure that you're not pushing to pee. Cause a lot of us in a hurry when we go, we sit down on the toilet and you don't even realize that you're trying to push the urine out to hurry up. But that can also cause so much stress on those organs. And if someone's already suffering from a prolapse, the last thing we want to do is have anything that's pushing. Okay. So for toileting with any prolapse, whether it be um, rectal, uh, rectocele, uh, uterine prolapse, or cystocele, which is a bladder prolapse, always use a squatty potty. Breathe and don't strain. Okay. Kind of general. Okay. Overall. Yeah. And then this kind of... I don't know if it's necessarily a good segue, but I'm going to use it as well. Um, so then when we're talking about pregnancy and giving birth and that kind of thing, because oftentimes, I mean, and you mentioned earlier that women um, who have bladder leakage, um, you know, I feel like that's something that you hear so often mm -hmm. in women after they've given birth. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like I don't know. It could just be me. That a cesarean would make it more likely that you would wind up with, at least with a, with some kind of like urinary prolapse. Mm. Um, when, so where I'm going with this is, <laughs> um, so when you're working with women after, after giving birth, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Um, and again, this might overlap with Mercier and the pelvic floor. Yeah. Like pelvic health in general after having a baby. Yeah. Um, one thing that we want to check is diastasis recti. So that's like that separation of the rectus abdominis muscle. So usually we'll see people six to eight weeks postpartum once they're cleared by their doctor, six weeks for vaginal birth, eight weeks for cesarean. 
Um, and we want to check diastasis recti. Usually if someone has it really bad, but also like have low back pain and just kind of sometimes go together. Not everyone, but sometimes. Um, but overall, after having a baby, pelvic floor dysfunction comes from kind of not being coordinated as in like, I kind of forgot how to contract my pelvic floor and my core. And it's just kind of like not having that muscle awareness anymore because of the trauma of childbirth. And of course there's different grades. If you're having a vaginal, um, vaginal birth, there's different grades of tearing. So one, two, three, or four. So that play a huge role on recovery, um, for the pelvic floor and pain and dysfunction and all of that. So after having a baby, the biggest thing is to get the core strength back slowly and safely. Stay away from things like crunches, push-ups, anything that's going to create too much intra-abdominal pressure. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to ever have to, have to hold your breath because you're lifting too heavy or trying something too hard because you can cause a prolapse. Um, as in, let's say you just had a baby and then you go to try to do jumping jacks or you go try to do a burpee or you go even try to like chase after a toddler and pick them up. Those things right after childbirth can cause a prolapse. You really want to just protect those organs, rest and slowly learn how to strengthen your core. So when I see that, we're going to go through gentle core strengthening, how to strengthen your core correctly, um, and then how to just regain that strength of the pelvic floor. So core and pelvic floor play a huge role after childbirth. I know that was a lot, but core and pelvic floor. Actually, extending on that, because what you were just saying, so this doesn't apply just to cesarean. This would be any kind of abdominal surgery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, hernia repairs, um, or people that... Even people that get like hernias often, whether mm -hmm. whatever yeah. kind of hernias they are, inguinal, umbilical, um, knowing how to breathe correctly plays a huge role. I can okay. go into the breathing of just, if you have a prolapse, you need to learn how to breathe correctly. If you just had a baby, let's learn how to keep your core tight and breathe and to protect our back and our pelvic floor. Can you do a Kegel and breathe? So I think no matter what kind of abdominal surgeries you have, vaginal births, whatever it may be, whatever trauma is happening to that core or pelvic floor, learning to breathe and then work those mus surrounding muscles correctly, play a huge role. And that's where physical therapy plays a huge role, you know? Okay. Yeah. Then I have another question. Yeah. It's still related to the surgery aspect okay. of it. So what, even for laparoscopic surgery, is there benefit in either pelvic floor therapy or emergency gate therapy just in helping to kind of rearrange that fascia tissue and, and overcome this, this is again, back to the scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So both Mercier and, um, the pelvic floor PT play a huge role with scar tissue and it's great to work on because scar tissue. So as it starts to heal together, it can bind down mm -hmm. the fascia and the multiple layers. And of course, when they're going in for cesarean or they're going in for whatever, um, arthroscopic surgeries, they have to get through many layers. And so we want to decrease that binding down of the layers by doing some, whether it be cross friction, scar mobs, whether someone needs cupping down the line, um, deep tissue mobilization, um, gynovisceral manipulation. So all of those things, just gentle fascial stuff plays a huge role too. And people don't think sometimes a more gentle approach can have an impact also. So yes, working on scar tissue, um, is huge and anyone will benefit from scar tissue. So let's say someone is coming from far away or someone can't make it into physical therapy be all the time because of a job. Uh, we can also teach our patients how to do it themselves, desensitize the scar and then get to working on the scar themselves and the things that they can do. Um, because those, you have to think they're sensory nerves on the surface and they cut through those sensory nerves. And so sometimes those Scars are really sensitive, especially big scars, whether it be a hysterectomy, um, like a lugs or laparoscopic now, but, or a cesarean, but desensitizing the area and then working on that scar tissue. It's big. Yeah. Well, I just feel like, I mean, I, I you know, I had my gallbladder removed laparoscopically, mm -hmm. but I still struggled for years afterwards mm -hmm. with, and I couldn't find, I, first of all, I didn't know where to look. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, it's like, well, it's really hard to find just like an abdominal massage therapist, which is what I was looking for. I didn't even know that, you know, this my floor physical therapy. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. It's hard to know where to go when yeah. you have certain surgery, especially if it's like gallbladder and you don't think 
Yeah, and but you know, yeah, of fashion. Yeah, you just don't like to put the two and two together. But yeah, and it plays a huge role because if you have scar tissue that's kind of near the diaphragm or the rib cage, that could play a huge role with breathing and how all those tissues are moving also. So yeah. All right, Gina, as we start to wrap up, is there anything that you want to mention? Um, I think the biggest thing is if someone's suffering from pelvic floor dysfunction, um, like I said, constipation, pelvic pain, prolapse, um, incontinence in any way, uh, to seek help, to know that having these dysfunctions is not normal and that they can find help. Um, um, no matter what state they're in. So some states need a referral from a doctor to go to a physical therapy place. Um, a lot of times they are covered by insurance. So it's just finding a good pelvic floor PT. Just anywhere you go, you got to find, you know, someone who's good, knows what they're doing. Um, and then when it comes to the fertility Mercier side of things, um, when it comes to fertility, just sometimes the natural approach can be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing is not everyone knows about it. That's the hardest thing. Uh, but it's just jumping straight to something that's going to, that's going to financially and emotionally and um, hormonally and mentally impact you just like IVF. It's a lot. IVF is huge, huge impact um, on all areas of your life and overall um, wellness. It's, it's a big, a big commitment. Um, so just maybe trying to take a step back and try a natural approach first before jumping straight to a medicated, um, cycle and going through the process. Um, and then also for people that want to just have regular healthy cycles, Mercy Therapy can help. With. Okay. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. How are people able to connect with you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you can email me at pelvic health and fertility at um, gmail.com. You can find me on my website at pelvic health and fertility.com uh, or Instagram at pelvic health and fertility. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Gina.